Welcome to this very special edition of Razorback Reels. I'm Elena Thompson. And I'm Gigi Kramer. Thank you for joining us. The 96th Annual Academy Awards took place this past Sunday, and we here at Razorback Reels are massive fans of Hollywood's biggest night. We'll be breaking down all the performances, fashion, winners, and losers of the night. After a tumultuous year of writing and acting strikes in Hollywood, the Oscars came back full force to honor actors, directors, and crew who shined in 2023. With a billion dollar return to the movie theaters this year, the industry certainly had something to celebrate. 2023 was the year of movies and 10 movies stood out amongst the pack. Each year, every movie fights for one of the coveted Best Picture nomination spots. The competition is so fierce that in 2009, the 82nd Academy Awards bumped the number of spots from 5 to 10. But being able to catch all 10 Best Picture noms is a feat in and of itself. Lucky for us, we have our very own cinephile, Drew Chamberlain, is here to talk about this year's top 10 films. Oh, Reels fans, how I've waited for this day. If you know me, you know the Oscars is my jam, and boy did I jam out this Sunday. I'm going to break down the collateral list of Best Picture nominees and the awards they won on and off screen. Starting off with Maestro, Bradley Cooper put his heart and soul into this biopic of conductor and composer Leonard Bernstein. Cooper starred, directed, produced, and wrote this movie. But after all of that, Maestro went home with absolutely nothing. Were there better movies on this list? Yes, but it goes without saying the music, the makeup, and performances from Carey Mulligan and Bradley Cooper make this at least worth a watch. Maestro gets a seven out of 10 from me. Next up, we have Past Lives. This South Korean romantic drama was a surprise to some when it made the nomination list. However, I can't be happier that it's here. This A24 produced movie follows two childhood friends as they reminisce over the 24 years they've known each other. Did I cry in this movie? Maybe. Was it an uncontrollable sob? I don't wanna talk about it. Seven out of 10. Up next, we have American Fiction. American Fiction uh, stars an all-star cast made up of Jeffrey Wright, Sterling K. Brown, and Tracy Ellis Ross. The satire was funny, self-aware, and had so much heart. While it didn't walk away with Best Picture, American Fiction did win Best Adapted Screenplay. Six out of 10. Next up, we have Poor Things. Poor Things was the second favorite in terms of nominations this year with 11. This twisted dark comedy features the breakout performance of Emma Stone, who walked away with her second Academy Award for Best Leading Actress. Alongside Emma were the likes of Mark Ruffalo and Willem Dafoe in some absolutely insane prosthetics. While Poor Things didn't win big for Yor Yorgos Lanthimos directing or Best Picture, it did win Oscars for makeup and hairstyling, costume design, and production design. Visually a great movie, felt like I needed a shower after. Seven out of 10. Next we have the movie of the summer, Barbie. Barbie was a revolutionary movie with sublime comedy, serious topics, amazing, mu amazing music, and a seriously talented cast and crew featuring Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, America Ferreira, Kate McKinnon, under the helm of Greta Gerwig. And how dare the Academy snub Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig for a nom. Seems as if the whole point of the movie went over the Academy's head. Barbie wasn't at a complete loss though. It did win Best Original Song for What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas O'Connell. Nine out of 10. The Zone of Interest. This A24 movie about a German SS officer and his family living next to the Auschwitz concentration camp was one of the hardest movies I've ever had to sit through. It was intense, it was heartbreaking, and it paralyzed me with a much deserved sound design Oscar. Additionally, it won Best International Feature, eight out of 10. Next, we have The Holdovers. This cozy but emotionally troubling movie is right out of the 70s with its writing, cinematography, and phenomenal performances from Paul Giamatti and Divine Joy Rudolph. And dude, Divine Joy Rudolph was the best part about this movie. Her win for Best Supporting Actress was, in my opinion, one of the most deserved wins of the night. What a heartbreaking speech I definitely didn't cry during. Nine out of 10. Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh my God, I'm not one to eagerly sit down and watch a three and a half hour long movie, but this movie sat me down and shut me up from the very beginning. The amazing performances from Lily Gladstone, Leo DiCaprio, and Robert De Niro made me twist in anguish as I watched this Martin Scorsese masterpiece unfold in front of my eyes. All of that then just to remind me that everything I saw was a true story? Ah, nine out of 10. Next, we have Anatomy of a Fall. If, if, this, if, if you didn't get around to watching this one, you have to set aside some time to watch this courtroom drama that rips your heart out and stomps on it a million times. This movie has three things that make it worth a watch. Number one, the Oscar, the Oscar winning original screenplay. Two, Sandra Schuler, who puts in a career best performance that leaves me guessing, did she kill her husband? And three, the dog acting, the best I've ever seen. 
Messi the dog rightfully deserved to see it in the Academy Awards for his performance in this movie. Call me crazy, but 10 out of 10. Lastly, we have the father of the movie's masterpiece about the father of the atomic bomb. I'm, of course, talking about Oppenheimer. This movie completely blew away the competition this year, taking home seven Academy Awards for Best Score, Best Cinematography, Best Editing, Best Supporting Actor for Robert Downey Jr., Best Lead Actor for Cillian Murphy, Best Director for Christopher Nolan, and finally, Oppenheimer took home the biggest award of the night, Best Picture. Might I add, the worst way to announce a Best Picture winner from Al Pacino, I don't know if it's the age or the alcohol, but I think I would have preferred if anyone else would have broke the news the way he did. Overall, Oppenheimer, nine out of 10. Just like the Oscars, this segment has gone on for far too long and I'm ready to start watching possible contenders for next year's. For Razorback Reels, I'm Drew Chamberlain. Thanks Drew for acting as our own personal Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> so Gigi, what are some of your favorites from this category? From this category, definitely Barbie. Um, unfortunately, I didn't give out to a ton of movies that ended up getting Oscar nominations, but I mean, I don't know anyone that hasn't seen Barbie, and it was, I saw it with my mom and my sister, so some of the most important women in my life, and I don't, it just made all of us cry, and it was such a good I mean, a good Barbie really did take it and run with it, I feel like, as far as popularity goes over the summer, but really Barbenheimer, I mean, everybody knows, yeah. Barbenheimer really, really did take the world by storm. Um, after watching Drew's segments, I think I'm left really, really wanting to watch The Maestro, A, eh? and also yes. Poor Things. Poor Things is another one that's been on my list, but especially after watching, I'm just really interested in watching and seeing what it's about. Um, are there any other things you have to add about Best Picture category? Um, definitely want to watch Maestro. I love the costume design, which I know it's Best Picture, but that's something I'm always looking at. So it was really fun to see little snippets, and I definitely have my what to watch list now. As Drew mentioned, the father of the atom bomb made, the, made a big impact on the box office and the award season. Here to break down the atomic success of Oppenheimer, we have Katie Glenn. I'm usually not the type to watch movies that are nominated for Oscars, but Oppenheimer was my exception. This past Sunday, Oppenheimer was nominated for 13 Oscars and went home with the most awards of the evening at seven. I'm Katie Glanton, and I'm going to break down Oppenheimer, the awards it won, and why I think it's beyond deserving of the Best Picture Award. Oppenheimer tells the story of J. Robert, Robert Oppenheimer and his development of the atomic bomb. The movie was told with such depth and brilliant visuals and compelling storytelling that can make anyone entertained. The first award that Oppenheimer won was that of the Best Supporting Actor Award in Robert Downey Jr. as Louis Strauss. Louis Strauss was the main antagonist of Oppenheimer as he held a former hearing against Oppenheimer for his security clearance of the atomic bomb. Downey played this part so truthfully, it was hard to imagine that he really was not Strauss in real life. The next Oppenheimer won for the award for film editing, cinematography, and original score. These were well warranted as the dramatic parts of the movie were so much more intense and really added to the storytelling that I ma think makes it groundbreaking. But the most outstanding performance in the movie was Killian Murphy as J. Robert Oppenheimer. This performance gained Murphy his first Oscar. His performance was breathtaking and something that I cannot get out of my head. He brought so much life and awe-inspiring emotion that I cried when I realized the weight of making an atomic, atomic bomb. All I can say is that the award was well-deserved. The direction of Oppenheimer was award-winning, in my opinion, and I guess the Academy agreed because Christopher Nolan went home with the Oscar for Best Direction. The different choices Nolan made in this are revolutionary. The choice of using black and white coloring for scenes in Strauss's perspective and colorful coloring in the scenes that were in Oppenheimer's perspective was brilliant. The last award and the most coveted was the Best Picture, which Oppenheimer took home. I think of all the nominees for Best Picture, Oppenheimer was the most deserving. Oppenheimer took a tr troubled and misunderstood historical figure and gave him the humanity in the most beautiful way imaginable. The seven time award winning film is a much watch. For Razorback Reels, I'm Katie Glanton. DC isn't the only place home to America's political issues. Join us after the break to cover how the latest politics have affected cinema. The Academy Awards are known as Hollywood's headlining event, but this past year, Hollywood made headlines for a total work, a total work stoppage. Two of the biggest unions in Hollywood went on strike, the Writers Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild. The main talking points of this protest were streaming residuals, artificial intelligence, and fair compensation. 
From May 1st to September 27th of 2023, the WGA protested the standard for the treatment of workers in the film industry. SAG-AFTRA followed closely, beginning their own strike on July 14th, 2023, and reaching a conclusion with the AMPTP on November 9th of 2023. The strikes have ended for the time being, but Hollywood will always be a backdrop for political action. Media is a force for change and a call for action. The decades-long history of motion picture has gone through many political movements. For almost 100 years, the Oscars have served as a cornerstone of popular American culture. And in the past decade, America has gone through a lot, ranging from unjust wars, great eras of social change, or rampant political scandals. Here to talk about the political undertones of the Academy Awards, we have Noah Kim. Thanks, Gigi. Since the Oscars attract many American eyes, the awards show has found itself serving as a soapbox for a wide array of social causes. My name is Noah Kim, and I'm here to discuss how protests and political movements shaped the modern Academy Awards. Now, in 1972, actor and activist Jane Fonda took an infamous trip to the then communist-run North Vietnam. In this time, many U.S. politicians worked hard to dehumanize all who lived under communist control. This makes calling airstrikes on civilians much easier from a PR perspective. Now, Fonda's trip to North Vietnam was an attempt to protest these bombings on non-military targets. Napalm was often used against North Vietnamese citizens, and this is recognized as a war crime by the United Nations. Fonda's trip sparked outrage and led her to be labeled as a backstabbing traitor by many of Nixon's top officials. Pretty ironic, you can read between the lines. Funny enough, she did end up winning the Best Actress just a couple of months later for her leading role in the thriller, Clute. Fonda, facing threats of being blacklisted, avoided the topic of Vietnam during her acceptance speech. But three years later, the film Hearts and Minds won the Best Documentary Award, and this movie was very staunchly against the Vietnam War. It criticized American troops for routinely dehumanizing the Vietnamese population on both sides. The filmmaker, in his acceptance speech, read a message from a Vietnamese uh, UN ambassador, and he thanked America for finally removing themselves from the Vietnam War. The Academy then condemned the filmmakers and apologized for broadcasting the statement. But let's flash forward to a post-9-11 America, when we decided to invade Iraq. Not because that's where Osama bin Laden was hiding out, but because politicians knew that the average American was two things, bad at Middle Eastern geography and in favor of oil prices going down. Many celebrities took to the 2003 Oscars to voice their concerns for this unjust war. Andy Serkis held a sign that read, No War for Oil. The Best Actor winner, Adrian Brody, condemned the dehumanization of war, and Michael Moore took to the stage to call Bush a fictitious president that was waging a fictitious war. He then repeated, Shame on you, Mr. Bush. Shame on you. And now we come to the present day. With Israel's continued bombing of the Gaza Strip, activism in this year's Academy Awards were pretty inevitable. Pro-Palestinian protesters managed to shut down a stretch of Sunset Boulevard in an attempt to delay the Oscars. The police then used battering rams to disperse this demonstration. Numerous attendees wore a red pin that featured a hand with a black heart. This pin represents a call for a ceasefire in Israel's bombing campaign of the Gaza Strip. Billie Eilish, Phineas O'Connell, Mark Ruffalo, and Rami Youssef all wore these pins. Ruffalo even endorsed the pro-Palestine protests that took place just outside. And Jonathan Glazer, the filmmaker behind the zone of interest, won for Best International Film. And during his acceptance speech, he said that he was sick of the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which led to conflict. His film discusses the inherent evil of those who are complicit with the Holocaust. And his speech gives Israel a similar criticism. We live in turbulent times. And as we turn to popular culture in a way to forget about the struggles happening all across the world. But sometimes push does come to shove. There are just some issues that need to be made clear to the American people. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I have been Noah Kim. Thanks, Noah, for sharing how Hollywood can be a force for social change. Just like Oscars past, this year's ceremony was full of remarkable and hilarious moments. Stick around to learn about some important Oscars history and catch all of the highlights of the evening. Academy Awards have undergone major changes over the course of its nearly 100-year history. When the first Academy Awards were handed out on May 16, 1929, the award recipients were announced to the public three months ahead of the ceremony. 
But in 1941, the Academy adopted the sealed envelope system, increasing the spectacle of the awards. Since the earliest years, public interest in the Oscars has run high. By the second year, a Los Angeles radio station did a live one-hour broadcast from the event, and the ceremony has had broadcast coverage ever since. In 1953, the ceremony was televised for the first time, and in 1966, the Oscars were first broadcast in color. The number of awards has also changed over the years. In the early years, only seven awards were given out, two for acting and one each for outstanding picture, directing, writing, and cinematography, and art direction. Since then, the number of award categories has grown slowly but steadily. The newest category, animated feature film, was added in 2001. With, a never, with an ever-changing ceremony, it takes some truly viral moments to make Oscars history. Here to recap memorable moments from this year's broadcast, we have Razorback Reels reporter Gracie Tui. The 96 Oscars offered many unforgettable moments, ranging from historic wins to heartfelt speeches and funny bits in between. I'm Gracie Tui, and I'll be breaking down the highlights of the night. Jimmy Kimmel opened the show with a monologue that didn't make too many enemies. Kimmel made jokes targeting Robert Downey Jr.'s past substance abuse, Alabama Senator Katie Britt, and others. He ended the opening monologue with a sincere round of applause for all the behind-the-scenes workers who didn't cross the picket lines during the last year's Hollywood strikes. The most memorable part of Jimmy Kimmel hosting was his unscripted dig at former President Donald Trump. Trump took to social media to share his negative review of the hosting, and Kimmel responded by asking, isn't it past your jail time? Acceptance speeches such as Dave Vine Joy Randolph's brought tears to the audience as she pas passionately spoke about her experiences. Emma Stone accepted the Best Actress Award in a panicked but funny manner as she joked about her wel wel wardrobe malfunction. Stone thanked her three-year-old daughter who, quote, turned the world technicolor while taking home her second Oscar. All original song nominees performed, but the standout performance came from a former Mouseketeer. Ryan Gosling performed I'm Just Ken and included the cast of Barbie in the performance, as well as guitar Ken Slash himself. I thought the performance was really fun and it was my favorite performance of the night. Some of the presenters had funny moments, such as the Barbenheimer feud, continuing with Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling, and Barbie co-stars Kate McKinnon and America Ferreira awarding the best documentary short film with a joke questioning if Jurassic Park films were documentaries. John Cena had a shocking moment when he came out naked to present best costumes. Cena's new moment was a joke in honor of 50 years since a streaker ran across the award stage and commemorated the importance of costume designers. And finally, Al Pacino was tasked with announcing the best picture winner. While it wasn't a fiasco like 2017's La La Land and Moonlight Mix-Up, his delivery was quite memorable. All these memorable moments came together for a truly unforgettable ceremony, and this time nobody got slapped. Thanks for tuning in to hear about the Oscars' best moments. For Razorback Reels, I'm Gracie Tui. Back to you, anchors. Thanks, Gracie, for that memorable report. Memorable report. <laughs> So, Gigi, what were some of your favorite moments from the Oscars this year? I definitely Ryan Gosling. I love watching the performances, and even though I'm not always able to watch the ceremony, it's always something I am sure to hit. Um, I was very shocked when I saw John Cena naked. That was surprising. Su very surprising. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of my favorite mom moments was whenever Al Pacino said, my eyes see Oppenheimer. That was very shocking to me. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was a very interesting delivery of the whole situation. Yeah. Um, speaking of, I loved the I'm Just Ken performance, and I feel like I just have to mention whenever Ryan Gosling went up to Emma Stone. Um, that really just fulfilled my La La Land heart, especially as he was a famous singer and she was, you know, a famous actress winning an award. It really just... La La Land yeah. will really haunt you forever. It's going to follow me everywhere, I think. I've definitely seen so many people talking about it on the internet. And the way he looked so proud when she's accepting her Best Actress Award. Yes. It was just such a sweet night for the two of them. And, and her acceptance speech overall, I just thought was so beautiful and so moving. She was just so compassionate and clearly so genuinely happy for everybody that she had worked with and all of the other women who didn't win the award. But I don't know. Overall, great Oscars this mm -hmm. year. It was one of my favorites to watch in a long time. Yes. While this ceremony honors many films each year, there are often films that go underappreciated by the Academy. Stay tuned for a breakdown of history's most infamous snubs.
Award, show ha award shows haven't always had the best reputation, especially when it comes to fairness. Whether an objectively amazing movie didn't get its flowers or vital community members miss out on recognition, it seems that these shows tend to hold bias. These ceremonies keep the details of voting under wraps and their picks often miss the mark with the public. We know it's impossible to make everyone happy, but it seems like people are disappointed with these shows more often than not. Everything from nominations to hosting is chosen by these academies and their decisions sometimes feel out of touch. Viewers are starting to wonder what these organizations are considering when awarding nominations and titles because it isn't always with public opinion. This Oscars was not the most controversial, but there were some moments that reminded us of very unjust losses of the past. Here to revisit some of the most disappointing snubs in the show's history, we have Razorback Reels reporter Francesca Brauhani. Despite the Academy Awards' prestigious representation, not every deserving film or artist has received their due recognition. Tonight, we'll delve into some of the most heart-wrenching snubs in Oscar history. In the Best Picture category, we have Gone with the Wind versus The Wizard of Oz in 1940. While Gone with the Wind might have won, The Wizard of Oz completely redefined the form of color filmmaking. Now, nearly 90 years later, it still contains some of the most recognizable quotes and images in movie history. Snubbed of a Best Picture win, Dorothy and co. had to reluctantly settle for being some of the most recognizable characters ever created. Shooting up to the 87th Academy Awards in 2015, Birdman snubbed the 12 years in the making boyhood for best picture. To me, this is an example that a star-studded Hollywood DNA film will always trump artistic visions of representation and realness. Boyhood deals with growing up, fitting in, and the social media and the complications of relationships as time actually moves on. A dedicated film with passion and originality or a Michael Keaton superhero seems like an easy choice for me. 2018 was a great year for Best Picture nominations. We were given Call Me By Your Name, Dunkirk, Lady Bird, Get Out, The Shape of Water, and Phantom Thread. In a twist of fate, the shape of, the shape of Water beat out everyone. And I get it, it is so hard to pick from such a stacked lineup. But Jordan Peele made a name for himself through Get Out. None of these contenders reached the genre-defining levels that Get Out did. How often does the Academy get the chance to reward a horror movie with Best Picture? Unfortunately, Peele was snubbed for Best Picture, but took home Best Screenplay. Now I want to discuss the actors who were snubbed for any of their categories or who did not receive a nomination at all. For example, Steve Buscemi, the acclaimed character actor best known for Fargo and Grown Ups, has never been nominated for an Oscar. And that keeps me up at night. The late Alec Rickman, Professor Snape, if you will, has also never been nominated for an Academy Award. Other big names who have never been nominated include Kevin Bacon, Catherine O'Hara, Jim Carrey, Cameron Diaz, Steve Martin, Hugh Grant, Nathan Lane, and Dennis Quaid. I mean, I could go on forever. But nothing is more frustrating than a Best Director snub. Stanley Kubrick, director of Dr. Strangelove, The Shining, A Clockwork Orange, and a 2001 Space Odyssey has been nominated over 10 times, taking home gold for Best Visual Effects for 2001 A Space Odyssey. I mean, give my man some love here. He is tired of making all of these cult classics that the Academy won't recognize. As for this year, we saw a lot of Oppenheimer and not enough of Barbie. Here's to hoping better decisions are made next year. I'm Francesca Brown-Hanny reporting for Razorback Reels. Thanks, Francesca, for shining some light on those deserving films. What is your biggest snub, Alina? I think my biggest snub probably comes from last year's Oscars when Jamie Lee Curtis went out over Stephanie Hugh. Definitely. I think that was probably my number one of all time because while I love Jamie Lee Curtis, and I loved her performance and everything everywhere all at once. I just think that it simply did not compare to Stephanie Hughes yeah. in like really any sense. I've been following Stephanie since she was off Broadway in some musicals, so I'm really proud of her for getting a nomination. Really sad she didn't win. I think another Oscar snub that I noticed was I mean, whenever <laughs> Andrew Garfield did not win for his performance in Tick, Tick, Boom for Best mm -hmm. Actor. I can't remember off the top of my head who he lost to. I just remember that I thought his performance again was so amazing. And, amazing. and again, I know you and I are both really partial to musicals yes. and all things, things like that. Well, he learned how to sing. Like, I he, know, he, and he, he was just so talented. Yeah. And I thought the chemistry between him and Vanessa Hudgens was just so amazing. But uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that's really all the, my major snubs. <laughs> and even though the Academy didn't consult reels when, cho when choosing this year's nominees, we have some big opinions. Catch us after the break to hear all about our personal Oscar picks. Well, we may not 
not be members of the Academy, we have lots of opinions on the Oscars this year. So we decided to give out our own awards. Welcome to the Golden Reel Awards. We'll be awarding over fav favorites from the past year of cinema. <laughs> Including those who may not have been recognized, recognized at this award season. Because unlike pretentious Hollywood, we have Southern hospitality. <laughs> to kick things <laughs> off, who does your Golden Reel go to for best dressed at Sunday's ceremony? So my best dress pick is Anya Taylor-Joy. I think she looks so beautiful in her dress. It's just this gorgeous silver and it's got this like silver, like feathering almost looking at the bottom. Yeah, here it is, you can see behind me. It just looks so beautiful. I thought that she was dressed so well. Anya Taylor-Joy always looks very regal and very pretty. And I think that this dress and all of her jewelry and accessorizing really just brought out her beauty. And I just thought she looked so beautiful, very swan-like. Yes. I will have to give mine to Zendaya. I was very happy to see everyone who showed up in pink this year. Um, unfortunately, Margot Robbie did not. But she's wearing Armani Privé, and I think she just looks like a princess and an old Hollywood star all at once. So it's definitely my favorite look of the night. And what actor gets your golden reel for his outstanding performance? So my best actor played Sylvanus in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is not from this award season, but it was probably one of my favorite movies of 2023, and his performance was just amazing. It made me very sad, which is how you know an actor's doing a good job. That is always true. My pick was from Little Freak Barry Cohen. I thought his performance in Saltburn, he was just so strange, and I know his final scenes in Saltburn were improvised, which again, like I said, he's just kind of a weirdo, and I think that being able to take big, brave steps like that as an actor is really impressive, so he gets my golden reel for the evening. Yes, now not to forget the ladies, which actress gave a show-stopping performance in your eyes? I think that my best actress is America Ferreira and Barbie. Um, I know she was nominated, but I just thought she gave a very heartfelt, moving performance in Barbie. And I, again, I just thought that her perception of womanhood was extremely moving, as again, I'm sure many of you agree with me. What about you? Well, to go with her co-star, I had to give it to Margot. Um, I loved America and Barbie and all her other movies this year, but to me, watching Margot kind of discover the world as Barbie, sometimes I think we forget what it looks like to be a woman from an outside perspective, and it just really hit me. And so I thought that she's definitely the best actress of the year, in my opinion. <laughs> and finally, which film stood out above all the rest this year? Definitely Dumb Money. Um, if you don't know, it's about the GameStop stock market, not crash, but it was this whole thing. I don't know much about finance. This movie was great because I found the story and the characters compelling, but also it was educational. <laughs> and I learned about stocks, which I've forgotten a lot of it now, but it was just a great movie overall. I definitely recommend it. So my pick this year may be a little bit basic again, but it is Barbie. I just thought Barbie, again, was a really, really moving movie. And again, I just thought the sets in Barbie were beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I just really thought that Barbie took you into a whole different world. And I think that that's something that's really, really interesting and really admirable to be able to do as a movie. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a wrap on this episode of Brazerback Reels. But before we go, we have some awards to give out to our anchors. <laughs> yes. So for tonight's Oscar, I'm going to be giving this to my best Reels co-anchor, Miss Gigi. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. We have the same award. Oh I'm giving my, my best co-anchor to Miss Elena Thompson. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Yes. <laughs> thank you for watching this episode. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Razorback underscore Reels. I'm Gigi Kramer. And I'm Elena Thompson. Have a wonderful night.